un ami disait, a friend once said, in Paris, you have memories everywhere. And it's true, for years now, I've known all of Paris, all its streets, yet every day I rediscover it. When I got my first Leica in 1950 or 1951, I was impressed by these newspaper billboards. Without wishing to enter into a history lesson, there was no TV then, there wasn't much in the way of radio, and as soon as the headlines went up, everybody would appear. I stood on a well-known street corner, Croix Rouge and Rue de Rennes, where everybody would come to read the headlines. And if you didn't remember the date, it'd be easy to find it, because that day the headline read, MacArthur dismissed. It was during the Korean War, so we can situate it in the 50s, and around 52 or... 53. So, in this neighborhood of Saint-Sulpice, which isn't far from where I live, I stayed for not even an hour, and everybody came along. We can see a, a lady carrying milk cans. We see a man wearing one of those berets you don't see anymore, like my father used to wear, a priest going by. A woman dressed in black. We see this man wearing a hat. We can see... I mean, we feel the streets are rather empty, and everyone would come to see these newspaper headlines, but what's amusing is to see how clothes have changed. On this sheet, you have the essence of Paris, because it had been snowing, and snow is always wonderful. Since for black and white photos, especially, it gives everything a sharp outline. I went downstairs through the Luxembourg Gardens, and you see this succession of people. I should add, it was the first time it had snowed that winter. The first snow is always magic because it doesn't snow as much these days, so there you are. And then the children came. And they'd come with their school because you can see another priest who's wearing his cassock and we can see a confusion of people. Here I had to climb on a chair, this one didn't come out right. And then, a miracle. Out of all these photos I took, there's one extraordinary one. I say it's extraordinary because someone once said to me that you don't take photos like that every day where everything's in place. That's what's so amazing, it all looks right. I was passing through Maubert, and you can tell the weather was rather changeable. I saw these two little girls looking at a horse through a shop window. And I liked these two little girls. Then I'm sure I must have spoken to them. And I followed them, and then they stopped. And that's when I took the picture. And what's amusing is if you look at the two girls' feet, they're slightly different. And back then, they wore aprons. As for the background, it must be said that back then, the films we had weren't very sensitive, nor were some of the lenses. So the subject, the two little girls, is very sharp, but the background is a bit out of focus. And elsewhere on the contact sheet, there's a young girl. I don't remember very well, but I do remember I met her near the Gary Lafayette department store. And then these two little girls disappeared. These two little girls disappeared like two birds flying off. A photographer is like a bird too. I appeared in front of them for a moment. In moments like that, you don't think of giving your address or sending copies of the photos. So I lost track of these two little girls, especially as it was way back in 1953 or 54. The years went by, and then, by a miracle, or maybe it wasn't, a few years later, not long ago, I was passing through Maubert again, and a well-dressed woman, wearing a necklace, kind of preppy looking, stops me and says, you're Bouba. And I say, yes. You took a photo of a little girl outside my antique shop. I say, yes, and I'm reminded of these two little girls. I say, yes, but there were two little girls. Yes, she says. One of the little girls was the daughter of the previous owner of the shop. And this girl became Miss France. And then, she became a tramp. 
You see how things go. But I couldn't tell you which of the girls it was because I never saw them again. A writer, Michel Tournier, said to me, you have a lot of photos of people taken from behind. Maybe we can do a book together. So we put them all together. Well, I was in this little car. A girlfriend was driving. As I wasn't driving, I could look out the window. And I saw this statue, which amused me, this naked couple. Come to think of it, if you look closely, statues are quite funny, but people don't look at them anymore. We see a man who's more or less naked beside a woman who's half-dressed. So I told her to stop the car, and I went to photograph the statue, because it was there in front of me. So I thought, why not seize the moment? And just then, this young couple came along. I swear I didn't set it up. It's uh, an adventure. In fact, every photo is an adventure. And on the same contact sheet, which has gotten a bit damaged over the years, when I did an exhibition at the Carnaval Museum, I'm not even the one who saw it first, I had this photo printed up because it hadn't ever been printed before. It's a photo taken at the Louvre Museum. It was raining and my attention must have been caught by the drops of rain. It looks like Venice. You'd think it was the Grand Canal with the bridge. I might add I've never believed in the objectivity of photography. What's more, you can make a photo say whatever you want, even without touching it up. You just have to change the caption. I was walking through the Parc de Sceaux, and I saw a little field with Japanese flowering cherry trees. It was such a wonderfully beautiful sight that people were going over to look at them. One should never forget that everyone is sensitive to beauty. A few days later, it was so nice out that I decided to go back. I can't remember now, but I think I must have taken two or three photos the first time. When I went back, it had been raining, so there were petals on the ground and it looked like snow. So we're back to this idea of objectivity. People have said to me, what's this little Japanese girl doing in the snow? But in fact, it's only petals. I saw this little Japanese girl. I tried to speak to her as best I could and I took a few photos. And there's this one photo where she's standing there as if she's waiting for something to fall out of the sky, as if she's waiting for the Messiah. In the end, it's a shower of snow, a shower of gold, a shower of light that rains down on her. I've done dozens of reports in Brittany. I love Brittany. So on the same contact sheet, you can see Bigouden, a traditional headdress. You can see little processions and fishermen. And suddenly in the corner, no, we mustn't forget it, a sand dune where there are two lovers. I took it from some distance. I did what I could, but I didn't want to disturb them. How many times have we all photographed lovers in Paris? And here it was in Brittany. And the girl's dress was opened up like the corolla of a flower. Is it a, a flower? It must be a flower. So you have the dune and two lovers, and I'll leave you to look at it. I wasn't expecting this one either. So it's another example of a lucky find rather than invention. For the first time in around 1956, I remember the date more or less, I wanted to go see Portugal. But bear in mind that at the time, we didn't have many photos or anything of countries like that, which were still quite isolated in 56. So I came to Nazaré. My wife and I had gone there by car. The journey back then was endless. It took two or three days. We parked the car, she had a rest, and I got out. People had told me about Nazare, so it was kind of an adventure. I love the term adventure in the best sense of the word. And I saw on the beach this man with his child in his arms, looking at the ocean, and he really was waiting for me to come along. It makes me laugh. When I say a photo was waiting for me, I mean that chance was waiting for me, the photographer's chance, the chance I had created after several days on the road. And what amuses me is that for once, almost all the photos on this contact sheet are interesting. 
Sometimes with contact sheets, there's just one. Sometimes you never print up any of them. But on this contact sheet, it looks like I'd been touched by the hand of God. There's someone sitting in front of this huge panorama, and this whole sheet is very rich. But it's not always the case. I've been to India perhaps 10 times, and unfortunately I've never seen the Taj Mahal. I'm told it's very beautiful. Once there was no train to get there, another time there was no airplane, but never mind. The tourists go there. I go to foreign countries to see someone, to see people like us, see a family, see how people eat, how they live, how they go to work in the fields. And here, every day, there was this meal. The man is sitting down and he's served by his children or daughters-in-law. So there's the grandfather, like a patriarch. He has his grandson on his lap. His food is served and he's eating. I was in India to photograph a man. It was a hard place to get to. It was a long way. There was no train. So we traveled in a kind of jeep. And the Hindu god would say to us, yes, we're nearly there. And we'd go another hour and he'd say, we'll make it. And at one point there wasn't even a bridge. And we had to ford the river. We'll make it. And then there was no hotel. We had nowhere to sleep. It's a very different approach to being a tourist. I have nothing against tourists. I like the idea, but I don't think I've traveled like a tourist. So we arrived. It was nightfall. Where can we sleep? We said, everything's easy in India. He said in broken English, very easy, you can sleep there. So we slept right there on a bed. We ate the little there was. When you sleep on the floor, you get up very early in the morning. I sprang up out of bed, and what did I see? This view was aiding for me. I hadn't planned this one either. It's amazing, but it was waiting for me. I'll always remember. Near a fire was the cow, people warming themselves up because it was cold. You can see their houses very clearly in the background, which is shrouded in a kind of mist. This photo, which wasn't included in the report at the time, is the one which has stood the test of time. I consider photographs as a gift, a gift in the sense of a present. It's a present. It's present, but it's also a gift. And to come up with this photo of New York, although I like the countryside, I've spent most of my life in big cities, I'm always in Paris and New York, and I feel at home there. On the same contact sheet, you can see a kind of gathering for what hadn't yet been called ecology. It's funny. I followed them, and then some other things. I had to go to Brooklyn Bridge, where I saw this girl who was looking at the water looking into infinity. That's a good word to end on, infinity. I think that the photographer always has one eye on infinity. He says to himself, hopefully, maybe today I'll take another photo. The weather's fine, maybe I'll cross the Seine this afternoon, go through the Luxembourg Gardens that I've been going through for years, and perhaps there'll be a photo waiting for me, perhaps a photo's waiting for me. So I'll be off now. I'll take a camera in my bag, though.